Hello and welcome to another special edition of Ancient Greece Revisited and another interview. Um, as always, it's going to be a very Greek story and very characteristically for a Greek story, it starts on board of a ship, a ship called Mataroa, that traveled from the port of Piraeus, taking an entire generation of intellectuals and artists from Piraeus by way of Italy to Paris, where they would flourish and eventually return to Greece. One of them was an architect who studied with famous Le Corbusier, an architect called Provelengios, and he was responsible for building this famous bar in the center of Athens called Au Revoir. The other is going to be the focus of this interview, an intellectual and perhaps a modern ancient Greek philosopher called Cornelius Castoriadis. And I'm joined by the expert on this man, a modern Greek philosopher by the name of Theophanes Tassis. Theophanes, welcome to our show. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. I'm sure you get plenty of them. Thank you very much for the invitation. Welcome. Um, I would like to start uh, kind of where we left off on board that, that famous vessel, the Mataroa. What happened, what was the purpose of that voyage? Who organized this voyage and what was the purpose? So the voyage was organized by the Institute for of Athens and its purpose was to somehow save the Afangate, the vanguard of the young Greek intellectuals with a scholarship provided by the French government. And uh, among those students, which were, as you said, architectures, musicians, uh, philosophers, historians, was also Cornelius Castoriadis. Cornelius Castoriadis was a member of the Communist Party since he was 13. When he was 15, he decided that the Communist Party was not so radical and, in fact, was actually promoting an authoritarian regime, the Soviet Union. So he became a Trotskyist and joined the group of Spirostinas. For that reason, the Communist Party asked him to come to the central offices in order to uh, give an apology. Castoriadis decided not to go, but a friend of him who also joined him with Trotskyists decided to go and confront the Communist Party. Unfortunately, his friend was murdered by the Communist Party and the Communist Party afterwards issued also a directive for Cornelius Castoriadis to be killed as well. So Cornelius Castoriadis spent a considerable amount of time in hiding with the help of his father and the opportunity by the French government was actually an opportunity which saved him his life. But the Communist Party, learning that Cornelius Castoriadis was planning to escape, planted someone on that ship an assassin, someone with the task to kill Cornelius Castoriadis with the first opportunity. Fortunately for us today, and I think also for contemporary philosophy, he did not find that opportunity. And once they arrived in Paris, Castoriadis went on with his life and managed to escape from the Greek Communist Party. It's like out of a novel. It is, and uh, if I may add this, I learned this story from Castoriadis' daughter. And Castoriadis' daughter, when she was a student, she also studied in Paris and became a psychoanalyst, met another Greek student there, and after they introduced themselves, she saw that the other person seemed somehow taken. Surprised. Surprised, and she asked, well, did I say something? I just introduced myself, and she said, well, you are Castoriadis. She said, yes. Let me say this. My father had the task to kill your father whilst your father was traveling to Paris. Wow. 
now it's a novel completed, you might say. There is a, there is a novel completed. And uh, like you said, luckily this assassin... Um, did not succeed or change his mind or who knows. Perhaps, yes, if I was writing that novel, I would have the assassin change his mind, uh, perhaps observing or learning something from... Although Castoriadis was very young and his, uh, his thought was not yet developed. Uh, but he must have been a very promising student at the age of 23. Well, he was one of the first to translate the works of Max Weber into Greek. He studied with the most prominent Greek philosophers of the time, Theodorakopoulos, uh, Tsatsos Despotopoulos, and every one of them was uh, really admiring Castoriadis for his intellectual capacities, and they prophesied a bright future for him. So he was considered a little genius, genius back then. In the Greece that he left in 1945 was obviously very different Greece that uh, some might be able to see through the through the window. Greece that was really, really ravaged by war. Um, perhaps not many people still in Europe understand uh, how much Greece and Athens were destroyed by the Second World War. So that he was really leaving behind a... A very bleak situation. A very bleak situation, uh, yes. And Greece was also on the brink of its civil war. Which would happen right after. Right after, a year or two years after. And the, the air uh, smelled of gunpowder, as the Greek expression goes. So mm -hmm. you could almost predict what would happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, so on board that, that uh, famous ship and into Paris, it's almost like passing to another dimension, perhaps, from one city to the other. And, and me, me growing up, obviously, in a very different time, I used to hear legends from Paris um, that uh, sounded not very dissimilar to, to Woody Allen's film, uh, Midnight in Paris. I, I, I kept hearing all these things happening and all this intellectual air. How much of it this is true? Well, I think Paris, after the Second World War, was the place to be. Especially considering philosophy. Well, imagine, Paris was the city of Sartre, of Camus, uh, the city of uh, Jean Kielevich, it would be the city of Michel Foucault, of Roland Barthes, uh, of Jacques Derrida, of Jean-François Lyotard. It, all those people were already 1945, 46 in Paris. They were either still students, they were either starting to become known or were already established philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre or Albert Camus. And the intellectual environment which Paris provided to Castoriadis was actually the best he could dream of because in no other city in the world at that time you would have so many philosophers and this kind of stimulating intellectual environment. I think what Berlin was in the 1920s was Paris in the late 40s, 50s mm -hmm. and especially later in the 60s so, as well. So the myth is true. <laughs> I think regarding philosophy, the myth is absolutely true. And, and this tradition, apart from all, all these great names that you mentioned, on, on a more popular level, there is, I think still to this day in France, this idea of the philosopher as someone that you can actually meet in a bar, like, like we do today, rather than someone that you would meet carved in marble only, right? There is a difference. Well, that's that's true, and that's also a difference between um, Paris and Berlin, uh, because the tradition of the public intellectual, of the public philosopher in, in Paris, in France, is actually quite similar to the role the philosopher played in ancient Greece, because in ancient Greece, the philosopher would go to the Agora. He would talk to the other citizens. He would participate in the everyday life. Philosophy was a way of living. And the same thing is true in Paris, because you could meet the philosophers in the cafes, you would know where they frequent, and you could talk with them. And they would participate also in the public sphere, they would take political stances. And this uh, tradition is, is very unique French. You don't see it so much, for example, in the UK. Going a step back, you talked about the famous May Revolt of 68, which was, let's say, the, the, the Woodstock of Europe. And it was really where like students took to the streets and uh, almost overthrew the De Gaulle uh, government. And if Castoriadis was, as I understand, very important, how come we haven't heard him outside of Greece? 
Well, meanwhile, he is known, but it's true that for two or three decades he wasn't known. The reason is that Castoriadis was a foreigner in France and he had a visa, so he was under the constant uh, danger of being expelled. So he had to work under various pseudonyms and his ideas were very well known, but not, not the man behind them. And his ideas infiltrated, if I may say so, the French uh, revolt of 68, because one of the members or a person who frequented at the meetings of socialism already was the younger, the older brother of Daniel Combetit. And so all the ideas of uh, socialism of Barbarie started influencing the circle of Daniel Combetit, and Daniel Combetit acknowledged this and said that he somehow plagiarized Cornelius Castoriadis' work. You have heard the famous uh, motto, power to imagination. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's, uh, that comes from Socialism and Barbary. Okay. Because one of the central notions in Castoriadis' work, as I think we will discuss later on, is imagination. Yes, yes, yes. And all these great uh, intellectual struggles somehow led him to ancient Greece. Yes, uh, but before that, he became a psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. So Castoriadis realized that Marxism was not adequate as a description of capitalistic reality after the Second World War because he could not describe the phenomenon of bureaucracy, bureaucracy, uh, total bureaucracy in the former Soviet Union regime, and also uh, fragmented or partial bureaucracy of the capitalism. And this is also the originality of Castoriadis' thought. Castoriadis formulated a critique both towards Western capitalism and the Soviet Union. And you have to imagine how hard that was because you had a world which was essentially divided between the two Iron spheres, Curtain. the Iron Curtain. And Castoriadis, at the same time when he was formulating a critique against Western capitalism, he was formulating a critique towards the so so Soviet regime. It was very, very difficult. Which I can imagine is perhaps what left him hanging in, in isolation. In isolation, It yes. was a complete, almost isolation because he was far too much advanced for his era. So he started the critique of bureaucracy, the Soviet regime, and then he realized the inadequacy of the Marxist theory. So he broke with Marxism in 1965 and then started a personal psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. And in this personal psychoanalysis he made, he realized that uh, basically Freud's problem was somehow the same problem Marx had encountered. And now I'm coming to the key concept of Castoriadis' thought, the radical imaginary. What is the radical imaginary? The radical imaginary is an ontological term which describes the the being as a creative process. Being is creating and creating ex nihilo. This very abstract concept has very two concrete manifestations on the level of the individual and on the level of society. On the level of the individual, the radical imaginary manifests itself as radical imagination. And why is imagination radical? Castoriadis characterizes imagination radical in order to differentiate it from the traditional notion of imagination. What's a traditional notion? The traditional notion is that imagination is a human ability of representing and combining things. For example, if you close your eyes, you can still see me because you can recall. I can imagine you. You can imagine you. You can recall via imagination my image. And I can imagine you with a hat. Exactly. Which is the so combination. You, which is the combinational element. But Castoriadis says that imagination is always creative. It creates new forms. It does not simply recalls or represents or combines. It manages to create new forms. For example, a piano is an ontological new form because it's something which is not existent in nature. In Plato, for example, imagination is something which is a mimesis, it's a mimetic process. You see something in nature and then you create it again. 
but we can create things which are nowhere in nature, like a piano. That's why imagination is radical, and it's what actually distinguishes us from all the other from all the other animals, because all the animals have imagination. For Castoriadis, even plants have a form of imagination. Even a cell has a form of imagination. Because but they need to represent the world to, it to work with it. Exactly. But in order to create something, you need to have radical imagination. And that is something only humans possess. So on the level of the individual, you have radical imagination. On the level of society, you have the social imaginary. And mm. what's the social imaginary? The social imaginary is the creative force which arises when different human beings create groups. For example, language. Language is something that one person cannot create. It's something that's being created by a collectivity. For example, our institutions. Everything is created by this Im Im imagin collective imagination. So you have the radical imagination on the level of the individual, and you have the uh, social imaginary on the level of society. Back to Marx and Freud. Freud says that basically, uh, human society and human history can be described with specific economic laws, which he claims that he has discovered. discovered. But at the same time, Marx claims that human history can be shaped by human action, specifically by the actions of the proletariat. Which is a contradiction. Which is a contradiction. So, Castoriadis says that Marx, on the one side, discovered the social imaginary, which is the human capacity of acting, of transforming the world. Of creating of new creating things. Of creating new things and creating new meanings. Radically new. Exactly. Like the piano. Exactly. But at the same time, Marx remains captivated of this uh, dominant signification of rationalism. It's almost like he created... Positivism. His, it's almost like he created a dream and then he went into that dream and became a, a prisoner of his own dream. In a way. I mean, he wanted to be a scientist. He was very positivistic. And so he suppressed this radical, this revolutionary element of his thought. Go to Freud now. F Freud did somehow the same thing. On the one side, he discovered radical imagination in the form of the subconscious, hermeneutic of dreams, neurosis, as a manifestation of the workings of radical imagination. And just a note on dreams, because this is very, very interesting, and I think it, it can give people this notion of the radical imaginary, um, which might sound very abstract. You know, dreams happen in, in fractions of a second, um, or so they say. But when you wake up, you have a story to tell. Maybe you're chased by a car and you're running and maybe that story will take five minutes to tell. So somehow this, these five minutes were compressed in this one second because that one second was a radical imagination. It, it was a moment where your psyche, I guess, according to Freud or, or your mind, uh, generated an entire world, an entire reality from nothing. And then uh, when you woke up, it took you five minutes just to describe it. So, so it's, it's uh, almost like the subconscious is that source of the radical imaginary, and then the rational mind just analyzes it. Would, would, would that be fair? In a way, yes. Radical imagination is at our core of our psyche. And uh, Freud discovered that. But at the same time as he discovered that, he tried to create a science of the, of the subconscious, of the unconscious. And the same way that Marx suppressed his uh, revolutionary discovery, Freud did exactly the same thing with radical imagination. And now comes Castoriadis, and he says, where well, they have failed, I will succeed. I will try to describe radical imagination and uh, social imaginary. And not only did he try to describe them, but he also used them as a part of a new revolutionary theory, which would be based on the creative potentials of the individual and society. So Castoriadis now starts a theory, a revolutionary practice, 
which aims towards autonomy. Autonomy again, on the level of the subject and on the level of society. That's a big word for Castoriadis, autonomy. autonomy. It's an ancient Greek word which means auto and nomos, auto myself, eaftos, and nomos, the law. I give myself my own laws. So for Castoriadis, a true democratic society is always an autonomous society, a society who manages to institute itself explicitly. And autonomy, it must be said, is very different from I'm going to do whatever I want. Of course. And let me go now again to the level of the subject. For Castoriadis, an autonomous uh, individuum is an individuum who is able to elucidate its radical imagination, which means reflect on his desires, reflect on his fears, not in order to be able to control them completely, but in order to be aware of them and increase its self-knowledge so that it can participate in the emancipatory practice. You cannot have an autonomous society without autonomous subjects, and you cannot have autonomous subject without an autonomy society. Mm -hmm. So the new revolutionary project, as described by Castoriadis, is a project of autonomy. And he believed that he found this autonomy in the ancient Greek polis. Exactly. So for Castoriadis, every society institutes itself, which means every society creates uh, meanings which, are, which enable people to live together. It institutes families, the sexual life, it institutes the political life, it religion. institutes religion, it institutes everything. But the problem is that all societies until ancient Greece were heteronomous societies because they were not able to recognize themselves as the origin of their own institutions. It's almost like they hid. They hid the fact that their institutions were their creations. Exactly. They ascribed them to a deity, to God. To magical ancestors, the to Tao, a deity. The the Buddha, the anything. Magical ancestors, as you said. But the ancient Greek culture was the first culture who was able to recognize itself as the creator of its own social meanings. And, and, not the gods. And to suffer it. Yes. And to suffer it because one thing that, and you're the man to ask, one, one thing that I always wanted to ask is a lot of the problems of modernity seem to be to the, in the fact that we have done away with tradition, we have done away with the gods, as, as false. It's almost like we have arrived at that knowledge that we have created all meanings, but this knowledge hasn't liberated us. It has created nihilism. What was so special about ancient Greek autonomy that although they knew that everything, they, uh, everything in their culture, in their society was man-made, how come they didn't fall into this nihilism? It's a very difficult question. I'm not sure if if I can answer it, and I'm also not sure if anyone has ever answered it, because you have a culture here which is completely aware of its own mortality and its uh, insignificance, because the ancient Greek worldview is a worldview which is tragic. Tragic in the sense that, first of all, there is no supreme god, then the gods are not interested about human affairs. They will not help us or save us. And there's no heaven. There's no heaven. There's no hell. There's no life after death. There's no inherent meaning in the universe. There's no concept of hope. There's no savior we are expecting. And uh, this tragic perspective manifests itself in proverbs like it's better never to be born. Or, Which is a, an, an amazing proverb. I don't know any other culture that had it. Those who the gods love, they die young. And, and, and in this tragic worldview, you have this culture which has such a lightness, such a love of life, and such an immense creativity. A, a gaiety. Yes, I mean, imagine that in, in, in the fifth century, you have the simultaneous uh, immersion of philosophy, democracy, uh, theater. The tragic theater. Tragic theater. Well, science, mathematics in the concept of 
proving something, not arithmetic like the Babylonians had it or the Egyptians or the Indians, prove the concept history of proof writing. history writing. And all of this happened in, in 100 years by a yes. culture so with such a tragic consciousness. I have, I have, no, I have no explanation about but, that, but neither has Castoriadis. It, at least I think we can agree that is the question. Yeah, that's the question. How, how, how the, the simultaneous emergence of all that well, Castoriadis would say they emerged exactly because of this autonomous society which allow the Athenians to ask questions, to question their tradition, to question even their gods. Of course, we cannot imagine the ordinary Athenian citizens of uh, someone who is able to question everything at once. We, we cannot forget that ultimately they executed Socrates. But that questionness but was in the air. It was in the air, it was there. Athens was struggling with itself. I mean, it was trying to set boundaries. It had let the genie off the lamp. And exactly because of the intensity of, 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 this, uh, of this thought, which was there and the creations which happened at that time, we have um, all those marvelous works of art, works of philosophy, and of course the political practice which inspired There's still a reference. There's still, still a reference. reference. It's not just a reference, it's, it's, it's our origin. Mm, mm, it was, mm. Castoriadis calls it the sperm. Mm, mm, the mm. sperm of Western culture and the sperm of the project of autonomy. I, I always imagined this idea of radical autonomy. And, and by the way, these are huge words in the dictionary of Castoriadis the radical imaginary and autonomy. I always imagine this radical imaginary all, almost like the Big Bang, because we hear from physicists, and uh, you, you were a physicist by training, um, that in the moment of the Big Bang, it's not just matter and energy that was created, it was time and space, which is a crazy thought. Um, but it's almost like Castoriadis repeats that, or at least that's how I understand it, on the, on the social level. It's almost like the very categories of thought are socially created, and they are created almost at once. Yes, Castoriadis uses the term um, creatio ex nihilo. Mm -hmm. Ex nihilo, not in nihilo or com nihilo. From nothing. Exactly. In nihilo means the creation of social imaginary significations, of meanings, does not happen in a void. No, not in nihilo. Uh, but at the same time, it uses all those elements of social reality to create something which you cannot reduct, subsume to those elements. It's a new ontological form. That's why radical creation is possible, because you have the social imaginary, because you have this creative potential of, of human beings. And if I understand it correctly, because these are fascinating and difficult topics, um, let's take, for example, the institution of marriage. And let's say a, uh, a certain scientist wants to understand what, what is marriage, why is marriage here. I think Castoriadis would, would show that marriage is part of a net a network of meanings, of significations. Uh, marriage cannot exist without the idea of romantic love, at least for us today. Romantic love cannot exist without the idea of the individual. The individual cannot exist without the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment without Rousseau, the <laughs> Rousseau without the noble savage. So it's like you take something from a given society and uh, you have to take the whole society with you. Um, and so the question is, how did that net, if everything inside of a culture refers to everything else. How did the whole thing got started? And my understanding of Castoriadis is pretty much like physicists. It started with a big bang, but not a physical one, a cultural one. And again, from what I understand, he placed that big bang for ancient Greece around the 10th century BC the time not of Homer the man, but the time that Homer spoke of. Mm -hmm. What, what would, could we expand on that? Well, Castoriadis uh, traces the origin of the Athenian polis and of the Athenian uh, um, democracy in the area you mentioned, because in that area you have the slowly um, 
crystallization or the slowly formation of the ancient Greek tragic worldview. Mm. And the key elements... And that was the key. That right. was the key, because without this tragic consciousness that the world is meaningless, that the gods do not care about, about us, that necessity is stronger than the gods, that uh, chance uh, defines our actions, that there is no afterlife, that there is no hope. All these notions started slowly to emerge and during the next centuries would lead to the creation of a democratic city, which then, yes, happened as a big bang. I'm not sure if Castoriadis here underestimates the continuity of those historical processes, but uh, you're right, he, he somehow describes it as a big bang, as an unexplainable big bang. Yes, and, and, and I think according to him, the reason why we can't explain it is that the very tools we use, our, 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 our thoughts, are a product of that Big Bang. Exactly. So it's almost like physicists say that they can explain everything four milliseconds after the Big Bang. Uh, but what happened four milliseconds before, they can't tell because even the categories of their thinking, time and space, did not exist. Yes, well, Castoriadis um, distinguishes between two dimensions of thought. On the one side, you have the poetic dimension, the creative dimension of thought. And on the other side, you have the identity, identitarian dimension of thought. The identity dimension of thought is the rationalistic element of thought which is the way of mathematics. If A, A is A, and if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Those very basic concepts of thinking, which define language, which define all our rationality. Logic, Logic. It's, it's reason per se. But at the same time, thinking has another aspect, which is creative, which mm. is about meaning, which is which cannot be completely analyzed thinking. via reason as we say, thinking up something, thinking up the piano. Yes, exactly. I would say that thinking is always something more than computing, for example. Mm, 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 mm. What is this something more? It's mm. the ability of creating meaning, for example, language. Language is not just a tool to describe physical reality. Mm -hmm. It is that as well, and the very important dimension of language is communication. But at the same time, language uses metaphors uses expressions which are completely meaningless. Which but they point us, to something. Yes, but they describe something. That's something outside invisible. of language They give almost. us meaning, exactly. They give us meaning. They somehow make us more human mm, mm, as mm, we are. Mm, 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 mm. And this, this metaphoric, uh, this metaphor, this poetic dimension of language is what is important for Castoriadis as well. Mm -hmm. Castoriadis is in a romantic tradition in this sense because mm -hmm. his emphasis is, is always on creativity, mm -hmm. on passion, on uh, authenticity, mm -hmm. on expression. That does not mean that he's irrational. He somehow manages to pull through this balance act between irrationality and rationality. He remains rational whilst at the same time being open to the rational, to the creative. And he was a very passionate man in his private life as well, in his... He liked to gamble, he was a gambler. Uh, he also lost uh, money on the stock market. He... Uh, like all economists, they're terrible at predicting the economy. He loved to love, he loved beautiful women, he was quite successful, although his physical appearance might not suggest that. Indeed. <laughs> he was a very passionate person in every aspect of his life. He was, not, he was not only a passionate thinker, he was a passionate friend, a passionate lover, he was a passionate revolutionary. And uh, he almost, when, when his, his, his thought led him back to ancient Greece, uh, it was a time around, I guess, the 70s or 80s when... Late when, 70s. Late yeah. 70s, where it wasn't in fashion in Paris at the time. Well, that, that, Castoriadis, for the most uh, time of his life, was always in a kind of intellectual exile. He was alone. He was really ahead of his time. Paris in the 60s and 70s stood in the more uh, Judaic tradition. Mm -hmm. You had Derrida, uh, with emphasis on texts, mm. on the written word. You had um, Levinas, 
you had, in, in a sense, um, Foucault and later on Bataille, Virilio. But ancient Greece was not uh, inspiring thinking. Mm -hmm. no, nobody mm -hmm. would work on ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. Well, the Germans did that, Heidegger and all of his students, Jaspers, Hannah Arendt, but not the school, the Frankfurt Schule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Paris, on the other side, Ancient Greece, the interest in ancient Greece was limited more or less to anthropologists like Pierre Vital Naquet, Pascal Vernet, all those people, all those guys. Castoriadis was the first philosopher who sought inspiration in ancient Greece and realized the emancipatory potential of the ancient Greece democracy. And the revolutionary potential. The revolutionary potential. And way before the bankruptcy of Marxism, okay, this bankruptcy was evident to Castoriadis since the 40s, but it was not evident for other people until the late 80s, until the, the collision of the Berlin Wall, anyway. Realized that a new revolutionary theory has to be a project of autonomy, and then you would have come back to ancient Greece in order to be inspired. Well, this Return to ancient Greece, Foucault did it as well, but he did it like 10, 15 years later with emphasis on the subject, with no political aspiration or goal. Mm -hmm. And so for Castoriadis, the ancient Greek polis was the exam, the blueprint of an autonomous society. Well, not the blueprint. He did not idealize ancient Greece no. and he did not say we should just uh, use all that elements and uh, translate them one by one into Perhaps we could say modernity. The, the proof. Perhaps we could say it's one society that stood as an autonomous society, as a society that self-instituted. Explicitly. Explicitly. So we can now say, look, it, it has been done. Yes, exactly. And it repeated itself. You have the uh, Renaissance cities, you have Florence, you have Venice. I mean, this project of autonomy, you can see it, see it again. You can see it, for example, in the French Revolution, you can see it in the commune, uh, Paris Commune, you can see it... In uh, the United States, in the, in the halls, the, the meeting halls. Exactly, town hall meetings during the uh, War of Independence. You can see it later on in the fight against the Soviet regime in the Hungarian uh, Revolution, 1956. You can see it in May 1968. You see it again arising and rising and rising again. And Castoriadis says that it, it will never stop rising since it managed to rise once in ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's always the alternative of, of barbary, of the destruction of mm -hmm. humankind. Okay, then it's over for autonomy. And coming into the present day, uh, there's this uh, concept, uh, strange perhaps in the beginning, called the end of history. And the idea is that, I mean, people can, can experience it personally as they travel the world. They see this almost the same culture in slight variations from Japan to New York. Um, I'm exaggerating slightly, of course, there are differences, but it seems like there's been a leveling of the world brought about by modernity and some would say by liberal democracy. So. It's almost like this radical imaginary that Castoriadis spoke about has fallen asleep. I, and I'm gonna speak on a personal level and on a personal frustration that I feel there's nothing new. Although we live in such a immensely technological society, the art, the thought, the philosophy that we produce is repetition of the same things. Has something happened to our ability to radically imagine? Well, that's certainly Castoriadis' point of view. Uh, Castoriadis thought that nothing of importance is happening. But I find it ironic because Castoriadis was saying that in the 1960s already, and uh, he went so far to claim that uh, cinematography is over. Nothing after Vertov, Eisenstein, Murnau or Lang. Uh, he hadn't seen the Blade Runner. <laughs> But at the same time, you had Antonioni, you had Kurosawa, you had Bergman, you had Bresson, Romer, Tarkovsky, Fellini, Buñuel, so Ozu. He was clearly wrong. And then he said, music is over also, with the exception of jazz, because he was a jazz lover and he's all 
actually his life was an in, in, improvisation as well. His thinking was definitely an improvisation because he loved improvisation. I think that Castoriadis was rather pessimistic uh, and that is common ground among intellectuals that is the trademark of the Frankfurt School and Castoriadis was pessimistic about that. I don't know why. I'm not so pessimistic. I think that uh, we are living in, in an era now of immense transformation in which already new things emerge. But are they new things like iPhones or are they new things like communism? They are new ways of living, new ways of being. But are they new ways like moving from one apartment to the other or from like moving from the countryside to the city? Uh, I would say like there are things like moving to another planet. So, so radical? Yes, I mean we are, we are living in an era in which artificial intelligence slowly starts to uh, take a, a more important role in our everyday life. We are in an era which we are starting slowly to think about updating ourselves, enhance ourselves. Transhumanism seems to be the new ideology perhaps and even the next religion, the next big thing, a new form of techno-spirituality. But all of this is happening at such an accelerating pace. It's like we are in an elevator which is moving at a great, at great speed, but we feel like nothing is moving. We mm -hmm. feel that everything is somehow Mm -hmm. Still. But if, if artificial intelligence is essentially taking data uh, from, from huge databases, so it takes what already exists and calculates and gives a result based on the data that already exists, how can it imagine something new? That's true. And uh, I completely agree. I cannot imagine, and I, uh, without the, the, I cannot imagine an algorithm able to imagine. Mm. That's that would be a contradiction in term because an algorithm has always a well-defined end purpose, mm. and it tries to reach its well-defined end purpose. It cannot be open-ended. Uh, an algorithm has no psyche. It has no soul. Mm -hmm. It may be intelligent. It may be in even, some definition of the term. It may very well be even intelligent in a human definition uh, of the term. And it may be intelligenter than us. But the difference is: will it have genuine intellectual curiosity? Mm -hmm. Will it have mm -hmm. passion to prove a mathem mathematical theorem? Mm -hmm. Will it be passionate about traveling to other galaxies? Mm -hmm. It will be able, it might even design uh, a robot to travel there. It might find it optimal, but would it find it worth doing? It would not be human, it would be another entity. Mm -hmm. This entity might be more intelligent than us, this entity might be the next species on this planet, but it would be soulless. And, and this tangent of thought is very much in your interests, um, because at some point, having dedicated, I guess, the first part of your life to Castoriadis thought, yet I feel you don't consider yourself a Castoriadist. W would that be fair? That's true, because I took Castoriadis' um, advice by heart, tried to become autonomous, and after spending over 10 years working on Castoriadis, writing my PhD on Castoriadis, publishing articles on Castoriadis. And writing a book on uh, Castoriadis. Writing a monograph on Castoriadis, yes. Uh, I realized that there were questions which were important for me, but that could not be answered in the horizon of Castoriadian theory. To name an example, Castoriadis is talking about autonomy. But when he's talking about autonomy as a process of, of self-knowledge, 
he does not seem to be interested in the care of the self. Because in ancient Greece, Gnoti Safton, self-knowledge was always followed by care of yourself. That was the aim of self-knowledge. And care of the self has a very important political dimension because if I'm not be able to care of myself, I will not be able to self-govern. And it will not be a human society. And if I'm not able to self-govern, I'm not able to participate in a democratic mm -hmm, society mm -hmm. as a democratic citizen. So you left, so you left off and where, where do, do we find you now? Well, where is after, your... Yes, well, after starting to explore the question of the care of the self and the way of livings, the art of livings, I've started working on a project I called Politics of Bios, in which the, the, the central issue is... I guess from Vios, from... From, yes, and because in Greek we have this difference between uh, bios and zoe. Mm -hmm. uh, and zoe is the animal life. Well, zoe is life common to all organisms. To all organisms. It is reproduction, it is uh, eating. eating, sleeping, uh, regenerating, and, and then dying. The difference is that human life does all those things as well but it cannot do all those processes without giving meaning to them. It mm, has to mm, give meaning mm, to them, mm, because mm. without meaning, it can't do them. And that's why we say biography and not zoography. Exactly, because it, what the, you write the meaningful are, events of your life. The meaningful life. events, exactly. And this, this, this difference between bios and zoe is very important, and we lost it in, in Latin. Mm. You don't have a difference in German, in Vita. French, in English. You have it in no other language. But for the ancient Greeks, the distinction was very important because for an ancient Greek, it was preferable, not only preferable to live a bios instead of a zoe, if you could not live a human life, a bios, it would be better for you to die. Mm, 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 zoe mm, was something for animals mm, mm, or mm. slaves. And on what you just said, the difference between Zoe and Vios, there is a tendency um, lately, and perhaps the works of uh, uh, Richard Dawkins are, are an example of that, of describing the human entity as an animal, as Zoe, um, almost like there's no qualitative difference between us and any other animal and whatever difference we perceive, and we, it's almost like an illusion that we like to believe. What, what do you have to say about that? No, we are animals, of course we are animals. Uh, but we have a radical imagination. All animals have imagination, even plants may have imagination. But we have the ability of creating meaning. And at the same time, we cannot live without meaning. We cannot eat, drink without meaning. For example, a devoted Muslim would prefer to die than eat pork, which is completely rational in a sense. Mm. No animal would mm. prefer to mm. die over mm. a belief. We are able to tell ourselves stories. Mm. We mm. go, mm. for example, to a forest and see God Apollo but or see a, a dragon. An animal sees in the forest what actually mm. is there. But the difference, I guess, between Castoriadis and someone like Dawkins is that Castoriadis thought that this is the only human way to live. It's not an illusion that we better do away with and throw it in the garbage. No, Castoriadis thought... Because you brought an excellent example of an extreme case of someone dying for their religion. And I guess for a rationalist today, that's a, a mark of, um, of, of, of decadence, perhaps, of how far we've strayed from logic. But I think for Castoriadis, this is exactly what makes life uh, livable. Yes, for, for Castoriadis stands in this ancient Greek tradition that an unreflected life is not, is worth not a human living. life, it's, it's not, not worth living. And. Uh, I also believe that. Well, of course, as a philosopher, I'm almost obliged to believe that. But I, I, I would believe that even if I would not be a philosopher. Mm. And on that word, uh, philosopher, um, we started 
our interview by a trip to Paris where the word philosopher is still very much alive. You can meet someone, I guess, I don't know if it happens in the street, you can say, I'm a you know, software engineer, uh, you're a philosopher, great to meet you. But uh, here in Greece it's not so. And the word philosopher, if you actually go out and say like you do, and I pl applaud you for that, if you say I'm a philosopher, that, that, that thing, it's almost like saying I'm Napoleon. <laughs> it's almost like saying I'm, it's almost like saying I'm just like Plato, which, which is, is not the case. It's, it's, it's strange in Greece. Um, it's strange and I think it's, it's somehow similar to the condition of poets. For example, in the 1950s and 60s in Greece, someone would hesitate to describe himself as a poet because mm -hmm. poet was considered something almost otherworldly. Sacred. Sacred almost. And you could also see very Greek, in many Greek films, poets were depicted and you could see that poets were very popular, very well respected and a kind of stars in that very era. Very successful with women. Very successful with women as well. That st slowly started to change in the in the 70s and 80s because you, you had lots of people writing poetry, lots of poetry getting published. And now today you can say I'm a poet and it's okay. Nothing, it's nothing. happens. Now philosophy somehow seems to replace that. It's 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 difficult to describe yourself as a philosopher. It went the other way. It went the other way exactly. But the strange thing is that if you say I'm a musician, nobody thinks that you're claiming to be Johann Sebastian Bach or John Coltrane. And when you say I'm a football player, nobody would think that you claim to be Messi. Or if you say I'm a physicist, no one would think that you are something like Albert Einstein or mm, Stephen mm, Hawking mm, or Joe mm, Penrose. Mm, mm. But when you say I'm a philosopher, they somehow think that you claim to be something like Plato, Kant or Heidegger, mm, mm, which mm, is not mm, true. Mm, because mm. philosopher is just someone who has studied philosophy. Mm -hmm. All my students are philosophers. Someone who works as a philosopher, mm -hmm. as a philosopher professor like I do, for example, or as a philosophical um, uh, consultant, for example. Mm -hmm or as a philosopher uh, who cares about people who are uh, in palliative care mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. uh, who works in a think tank, it's someone mm -hmm. who writes articles. Not every philosopher is an iconoclast, mm -hmm. someone who makes a radical contribution in the history mm -hmm. of thought. Mm -hmm. But we are all philosophers working in this area. So the, the term philosopher has, n has not to be so charged mm. as it so is, grand, at least so grand. The, it's not something grand. So, and and, and it, starts, it starts, yeah. starts to change slowly in Greece. Well, hopefully. I and am seeing that now. In a personal conversation, you said that you wanted to be remembered, if not for everything else, at least for the man who put... Somehow contributed to that. Brought, uh, demystified that word and brought it down to the people who can then claim it and say, I'm a philosopher, you're a philosopher. I definitely try to do so and now lots of my colleagues describe themselves as philosophers and lots of my students do so in Greece and I'm really glad because if this doesn't happen it will be very difficult to actually uh, create new philosophy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. actually think new ideas, new, create new mm -hmm, meanings. Mm -hmm. That's why it is so important. Theophanes, where can we find you? Where can you find me? Uh, well, mostly people who would be very interested in meeting you, speaking to you, engaging professionally. Oh, well, you can definitely read my books in, in Greek, currently translated. In, We're going to put the links below for certain. Currently translated into French and English as well, but mm -hmm. uh, Facebook, of course, um, Twitter, of course, Instagram, all the social media. Mm -hmm. You can follow me there. You're very mm -hmm. welcome. We're, we're going to put all the details below and uh, you, you, you have your expertise on Castoriadis and, and you have your own thought as a, as a philosopher, uh, which has very much to do about technology and uh, humanism, you could call it, and perhaps how we can remain human well, in, in a technological world. What I'm trying to think about currently is what I'm calling um, iconistic society. Iconistic society um, is a society in which human interactions, production of goods and institutions are being digitalized mm -hmm. and those creating a um, hybrid 
hybrid reality, which is both analog and digital at the same time. Virtual and physical at the same it's time. It's virtual and physical, digital and physical at the same time. And in this iconistic society, we are communicating to each other through images. Mm -hmm. And for me, this creation of an image at the same time includes the danger of a new form of alienation. Mm -hmm. Because instead of... It's an abstraction. It's, it's a self-image in... We can think of ourselves like narcissists in front of a digital lake. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Instead of improving our bodily self, we are spending our time our in avatar. cultivating our, our image, our digital mm -hmm, image. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we experience life through that image. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We might uh, be under the illusion that we instrumentalize our image in order to become financially successful, And let's not, not forget hearing the siren that, uh, you know, mortality is, is just uh, a few meters away, always. It's away and we are in the center of the city, it's the Agora. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I would love to thank you once again uh, for all that. Uh, like I said, we're going to put all the details below. Um, I'm sure it's not going to be the last time. And uh, I've heard, being in this beautiful place, that uh, friends never say goodbye. They just say au revoir. Thank you and au revoir. Au revoir.